right, Nostalgia Trappers, David Parsons here. Welcome to the program. I hope you're doing well. Got a really fun conversation to share with you today. My guest is Blake Scott Ball. He is the author of a book called Charlie Brown's America, The Popular Politics of Peanuts. This book has been getting a lot of attention lately, very well deserved. I learned so much in this conversation. I don't know how much you know about Peanuts, the comic strip which is so much more than a comic strip. I mean, when I think about Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Lucy, etc., they seem like archetypal figures in the American imagination. Uh, They've been around certainly my entire life and, and well before I was ever born. These characters were on the pages of American newspapers every day from 1950 to the year 2000. And as a result, Peanuts, the comic strip, and all the ephemera around it Uh, offers us a really important record of that history. And what Blake has done with this book is sort of trace that that period uh, and all the things that were happening around it, like the Cold War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, feminism, etc., and and shown us how how Charles Schultz sort of charted a path through that, that history with these characters. You know, there's something there's something deep and heavy Uh, about Peanuts. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Charlie Brown Christmas special, but that certainly captures to me what is what is most important about about this this work of art, this extraordinary output of 50 years. Uh, Is there something like, I don't know, Peanuts shows us that the world is is really hard uh, and is really lonely and alienating. And there's something there's something really dark uh, that Charles Schultz is trying to show us. I don't know if you get that same feeling. But this conversation with Blake helped me, uh, I think, put a lot of that, those feelings into, into words and helped me make sense of those ideas. This was really fun. Um, and, you know, like we talk about in this conversation, there's so much more uh, to get at when you're thinking about uh, comics and these certain figures like uh, and Calvin and Hobbes and even The Far Side uh, were, were comics that, that certainly touched something deep in me uh, uh, as, a, as a young person. And, and we get into, you know, the difference between reading these things as a child and then reading them as an adult, uh, how much more haunting all these things uh, become as you realize that these artists were really tapping into some of the deepest wells of the stuff within us. So I hope you enjoy this conversation about Charlie Brown's America, the popular politics of peanuts and go pick up Blake's book. Uh, I think you will find a lot of Really, really deep connections in it. Uh, so enjoy this conversation. If you like what we do on Nostalgia Trap, there's lots more on our Patreon page. If you go to patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap, you can subscribe and access tons of bonus material, conversations about history and politics and pop culture, and my series on the Vietnam War called Nam TV. All of that is for subscribers. So again, you can do that at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap thanks so much and enjoy this conversation here is me talking with blake scott ball all right blake it's great to see you blake scott ball thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate it been looking at the cover of your book uh just popping up on social media for the last several weeks it's such a cool cover (laughs) but i want to make sure i say the title of it before we get started it's called charlie brown's america the popular politics of peanuts uh thanks for joining me i appreciate it yeah thanks for having me that's fun so i mean what everyone is gonna gonna want to know i think uh is is sort of why why peanuts uh, for 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 you personally, but also um, for for the wider sort of the, the wider sort of picture of American culture and politics, why is Peanuts such a such a key text? Because you know, reading through your stuff um, and reading that you know um, your book is 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 sort of a a journey through this insane period of time, nineteen fifty to two thousand, that Charles Schultz wrote this thing. Um, what got you into what got you into Peanuts as a as a scholarly study? Yeah, well, you know, Peanuts had always sort of struck me as this like, um, like deceptively covert kind of uh, kind of text. Like it, it's always sort of um, it's always sort of uh, on its surface uh, appealing, um, but but not really um, 
uh, very uh, uh, inoffensive, and you know, no, nobody's uh, nobody's going to have too many complaints about uh, Charlie Brown or, or Snoopy. But but then, um, as you spend any amount of time with it, you start to realize, like, man, there's some there's some like deep, subtle stuff going on here, and and that that kind of um, intrigue goes back all the way all the way back to being a kid reading mm-hmm. uh, the the newspaper comic strips and and Charlie Brown always being the one that like if there was going to be one that kind of stumped me like I didn't understand what was going or what or what I was the takeaway was or you know why this doesn't seem funny uh, it was going to be Charlie Brown and um, so I just always had this intrigue and as a scholar I, I wanted to find something that was like, um, I, I had this, I had this deep faith that, um, that it's in these kind of innocent pop cultural spaces where we actually kind of let our guard down and say yeah. a lot of things about ourselves that we just assume everyone agrees with, um, without that we kind of take for granted. And so, um, so as I started digging for possible candidates, um, uh, very quickly peanuts emerged as this daily uh 50 year long text um that was immensely popular and yet um there hadn't been a lot of scholarly work done on it by the time i started uh started my research and so uh i said all right well, let's take on let's take on charlie brown yeah that's kind of amazing to me it's just like it's <laughs> like charlie brown is just, and snoopy are just sitting there as these like ubiquitous icons of american 20th mm-hmm. century culture and yet we're mm-hmm. sitting here being like what we take them for granted they're almost just like <laughs> they i mean they really seem like almost like biblical characters to me like they've just all, they've <laughs> always been there you know yeah, um yeah but i agree with you i feel i, I identify with that uh sort of growing up reading newspaper comics i don't know how many young people read mm-hmm. newspaper comics i mean there's still comics in the newspapers <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. but peanuts was just, yeah, always there. And I'm not sure I went to it for like a big hearty laugh or I'm not sure what <laughs> it was just sort of always there. But, you, you mm-hmm. know, as I get older, it's, you know, that, that I just held up my, uh, my vinyl copy of the Vince Garaldi, uh, soundtrack <laughs> to it's, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. But like that Christmas special, as I get older, like gets more, like deep and resonant <laughs> and archetypal. Um, mm. it, it really, it's so, it's interesting because it's my, I'm, un- I'm wondering like how much is peanuts for kids even? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, that, that's a great question. Charles Schultz definitely recognized that kids would be reading it. And, and so, you know, he, he, um, took very seriously that he, he didn't want to have anything there that would be, inappropriate for kids um uh, in in his in his kind of uh judeo-christian sense but um but at the same time on a number of occasions he says you know this people assume this is written for kids i'm not writing to kids I, i'm writing to you know or he was writing to newspaper readers mm-hmm. right that's that's who he's that's who his audience is and uh and so in that case it makes sense that he deals with with really kind of uh, deep adult uh, sort of themes and also that he would deal with the kind of issues that they were coming to the newspaper to read about anyways, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, um, civil rights and in Vietnam and and, uh, debates over gender and feminism and all these sorts of things. Yeah. And and the way that you you established this Scholl's character, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about him, because, you know, he's this I didn't know a whole lot about him as a as a person. But but mm-hmm. finding out mm-hmm. that he was, you know, socially conservative, evangelical Christian, you know, that these mm-hmm. sorts of character elements didn't really surprise me. Uh, but but <laughs> well, Charles Schultz, uh, can you tell a little I know the book does not function as a biography. It's more like this kind of um, this, this sort of landscape of culture and politics that, mm-hmm. that he creates mm-hmm. and tracking that. Mm-hmm. But but who is Charles Schultz? Where does this guy come from? Because it seems like he is, <laughs> he is kind of like almost like that middle American of the 20th century, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, to spend to spend much time with Charles Schultz, he he feels a lot like um, one of my good friends. When we would talk about this, he was like, "Man, it feels like uh, he feels of the same type as like uh, Mister Rogers, or like you know, like mm-hmm. a Jim Henson, or you know, so someone like this." And and um, he's really um, he's he's probably 
<laughs> he's um, he's really a, a interesting but kind of um, um, modest uh, person. He comes from um, he comes from St. Paul, Minnesota. He's mm-hmm. born uh, in the early 1920s. Um, so he's growing up in uh, the Depression era. Um, he's an only child. His dad is a barber. And uh, so that's why we find Charlie Brown, uh, Charlie Brown's dad's a barber, uh, oftentimes when he refers to him. Um, and um, so he very much has this sort of business, um, kind of business conservatism in, in his worldview. Um, and um, he grows up loving art. Uh, he's pretty smart kid. He, he gets, he gets jumped ahead a grade, uh, in school, in, in elementary school. And, and it seems kind of for the worse because, uh, because he ends up sort of falling behind and, and has a lot of frustrations with school. And I think finds a lot of, um, kind of comfort in, uh, the artistic abilities that he has and, mm. and doing that instead of the, the schoolwork that's so frustrating to him. And um, so he finishes school. Um, his mother sees an ad in uh, one of the local papers for a correspondence art program. And so instead of like college or any kind of technical school, they, uh, they end up putting him in this art program. And um, he uh, kind of flies to the front of, of the program with that so much so that when he finishes up, he's actually offered a job uh, by the school, uh, which was which was there in Minneapolis, uh, is offered a job to to uh, come in and, and begin work as an instructor uh, for the school. And then um, World War II uh, breaks out and he gets drafted. Um, he's drafted in 1942. Uh, it was, it came like as a complete shock to him. He, he never imagined himself being, uh, a soldier or a, he, he was, he was, um, he loved sports, but he wasn't a particularly like aggressive person. Um, and so here he goes, uh, off to war, um, while he's in training in Kentucky, his mother passes away from cancer. Um, uh, cancer that that his mother and father had known about, but they had never shared with uh, with him that 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 was going on, um, and uh, and so then he ends up in uh, in in France and Germany. Um, he is present at the uh, at the liberation of Dachau. He he's part of the security forces there, helping you know kind of process this as they're as they're bringing survivors out and. Um, um, it, it, he remembers this whole period. as just a very, um, impactful and deeply lonely time. Uh, he just felt completely separated. He's, he said he was constantly worried that something was going to happen to his dad now that, you know, that his mother had seemed to suddenly die. And, um, so he, he was just, um, he, he was very honored in, 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 felt like he participated in something important, but at the same time, he was just very personally dislocated. And, um, so that's really when he comes back, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Minnesota, that's when he starts searching for something to kind of connect with and, and find a, a place. And, and I, he kind of finds, finds that meaning in, in two things. I think one is, is, just pursuing all out. This guy's like tireless in pursuing, trying to get um, a job as a full-time cartoonist. Mm. And, and number two, um, it is in Christianity. Um, he, uh, finds a community actually connects with the pastor who had, cause he'd never, they never really gone to church much. They were Lutheran, but kind of it was never really a big thing at their house. Um, but he connects with the pastor who had done his mother's funeral service and gets connected to kind of a young adult uh, Bible study group. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he just between his kind of art community at the at the uh, correspondence school and this Bible study group. He uh, he's kind of finding his identity by the late 1940s. Mm. Yeah. And it seems like I mean, speaking of like, you know, for kids or not, I mean, there's a 
there's something haunted about peanuts, you know, and something, <laughs> and and it feels like you know hearing about Charles Schultz's experiences in World War II, not just the uh you know the visceral experience of of war and violence, but also having his mother just unexpectedly die and and worrying about mm-hmm. his dad. I mean, all of that seems very identifiable in the world of peanuts, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, absolutely. And, yeah, it's it's all there. So, so how much, I mean, it's, it's funny because it, I feel like that one of the big arguments of your book is that, you know, here's, here's Charles Schultz coming to terms with all these big things that happen in the 20th century, the things we think about with, you know, civil rights, Vietnam War, et cetera, but he does it in a very subtle way. And one of the things you, you talk about in your introduction is sort of ha- contrasting it with Doonesbury, you know, and how much like <laughs> when Doonesbury arrives, Schultz is like disgusted by it and like how, uh, how, you know, how on the nose it is and how direct it is about like social mm-hmm. and political discourse um mm-hmm. wh- wh- where does where does that impulse come from because it seems like it is a combination of like his christianity and and then the hauntedness combined to create this <laughs> this impulse to i don't know it's a it's a it's a centrism and some people would say that's sort of a bland thing but with mm-hmm. with, 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 mm-hmm. with with him with schultz it's like the impulse is is different it seems to yeah yeah he's um yeah you're i think you're dead on there like he um i mean there, there there's probably a few different impulses in action like he definitely sees what he does as um as a cartoonist he sees it as a business like he realizes that um he he said he said one time um when i write i realize i'm writing for two different editors one is um, one is the the editors of uh, of my syndicate and the newspapers who are their interest in this is to sell more newspapers. And so if if mm-hmm. what I do is not appealing or interesting or, you know, whatever, then then I'm not doing my job. And uh, and so he had that set of editors and then he had his audience who he would say, you know, very often if if uh, um, if if he wasn't doing his job well, or they didn't think he was doing his job well, he was going to hear about it, mm-hmm. uh, in, in mountains of, of fan letters. And so, um, which so are just a, very, not to interrupt, but th- that's kind of like your central methodology here. And it, yeah. is reading these fan letters, um, mm-hmm. that, that, uh, you know, you, you, you talk about how he, he's getting at some point, you know, more than a hundred fan letters a day. When does that yeah. start? When do, when do people start reacting to peanuts that way? Yeah. Um, it, it, so it starts um, very early on. Uh, so so Peanuts gets its national start in um, uh, October second, nineteen fifty, mm-hmm. um, and it um, he starts getting letters um, in the first couple of years because even even at its outset, um, Peanuts uh, launches in some in some fairly prominent papers. I mean, he's in. Uh, day one, they're in Washington Post. They're in the Denver Post, the Seattle Times. Um, so you know some some pretty big markets, and uh, and it and it, growth is a little slow for the first couple of years, um, and then uh, year three and four, it, it really just starts taking off. Um, part of that was because of uh, the beginning of some uh, some book reprints um, that uh, that start getting these in in some other spaces uh, where where people uh, could find them outside the newspaper and then they start requesting it with their with their newspaper. Um, but uh, uh, I'm sorry. Now I've lost. I was <laughs> thinking. I'm myself away no, I'm thinking person. about the way that fans <laughs> respond to this thing. Um, oh but, yeah. But also, but also, just uh, maybe we can just take decade by decade because it, yeah. it's such a to me like the fact that that, that peanuts is is in you know daily uh, you're seeing daily peanuts comics from 1950 October 1950 to February 2000 when Schultz dies is like this extraordinary record and it seems like that's part of the part of the the thrust of your project is to just to you know sort of reveal what that is and 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 think about what it means but um in the 1950s he's writing uh, you know in the cold in the midst of the cold war well, how is the Cold War finding its way into the into these panels? I mean, there's so much with Char- with with um with with Schultz because he also you know we could talk about like the development of the comic form, etc. But it seems mm-hmm. like for nostalgia trap, you know, we're really concerned about the politics. 
How did he? Yeah. How did how did how did the Cold War fall into peanuts? Yeah, it. Um, or at least the well, early Cold War, I should say. Yeah. Right. Um, um, so, uh, well, from it from its outset, you know, when um, when Schultz first comes home from the war and is trying to uh, pitch ideas for for a new comic strip, he really wanted to do something that was kind of satirical, like um, uh, soldier life. Uh, kind of wartime sort sort of thing, um, and and some of his colleagues that that he looked up to were like were like, man, people are people are tired of war. Like, there's been a lot of war in the last decade. Like, uh, people aren't really interested in that. But he drew these kind of really uh, funny child caricatures, and like, uh, you know, you should you should really lean into this children thing. And you know, in in hindsight, it, it, it makes all the sense in the world that, uh, you know, he's he's talking to the parents of, of baby boomers. Um, and so there are a lot of kids around. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a, this is an age that's going to be defined by the anxieties that parents have over trying to raise mm-hmm. these large families. Um, uh, even even more than that, he deals with in these early years kind of um, a lot of the jokes deal with kind of the children's misperceptions of the world. And so, for example, uh, Linus, uh, one time, uh, Linus is one of the younger characters in the in the 50s. And one day Linus goes goes outside. He's all bundled up. His mom's got his you know winter cap on and he goes heading out and snow begins to fall. And this panic sets in on his face and he turns around and he rushes back to the house. And on the way, he runs into Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says, what's the matter? What's going on? And Linus says, um, uh, uh, or, or Charlie Brown says, well, you know, it, it's just a little snowfall. Nothing to be too worried about. He's like, says, oh, thank goodness. I, I, I was afraid it was that nuclear fallout everybody keeps talking about. Wow. Right. And so, you know, kind of very subtly here uh-huh. is, you know, here is um, Schultz commenting on uh, just the kind of pervasive anxieties of, uh, of this thing. Um, in other cases, we see um, uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy playing uh, hydrogen bomb test and mm. uh, they're, you know, pr- kind of preparing for uh, these sorts of scenarios of, of uh, what a, a uh, active nuclear uh, age uh, might look like and, and things like this. So it's, it's really, you know, it's played, it's played oftentimes sort of as, as a, as a joke, but the, but the joke of it is almost the, the absurdity of, of what children, the world children are having to grow up in, in the yeah. 1950s. Yeah. Um, and, and a, a very just, just, uh, 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 uh kind of tangible grasp of, of, of just how absurd the world has become. Well, I, the, the, the adults in, in peanuts, I mean, it seems like that's sort of the, one of the central things that everyone remembers about peanuts, especially the, the sort of animated specials is the voice of the adults that are whoa, 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 and it's sort of like <laughs> the idea that they're, and to me that captures something really, really profound about childhood actually is this, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the almost the, the alienation and the loneliness. And you, you mentioned the loneliness, loneliness of, of Schultz in, in World War II. It seems like it's interesting to me that he would want to go back, that he would want to like do this because he was an only child, right? So he didn't like yeah, grow up right. with a big family like this. That's right. Um, yep. Yep. So but, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, but but he he is kind of simultaneously with the rest of the country experiencing this this very new experience. He ends up with with five kids. Mm. And uh, mm-hmm. so he has he goes from being an only child to a household full of kids. Um, and, and speaking on the idea of alienation, another one of my favorite strips from this period is Charlie Brown walks over to the telephone, picks, <laughs> picks up the telephone, says, hello, operator. And the final panel says, could you tell me a story, please? <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> it's just so you know, it's so pitiful, but it's, it's so but insanely it's, yeah. bleak. I yeah. think that's part of it. Yeah. If I, if, I, if, yeah. if people have, have listening to this have not seen like the the Charlie Brown Christmas special, um, mm. there's something so. I mean, I'm I'm, why, I'm like, who is this for? It, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like I said, it, it it seems it's deeper and sadder every time I watch mm-hmm. it. There's something mm-hmm. so so sad about it and i would even say depressing yep. about it it's very close actually I, th- I was thinking about the muppets a lot actually when i was reading your, your book because it's sort yeah. of like there's something really dark in there too 
um, <laughs> yeah. as much as it's, yeah. it's yeah. Uh, um, and that darkness is God, where does that come from? Mm. It's, it seems like it's, 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 it's like Tr- Schultz is tracking, um, a national, a national sort of feeling almost. And it, yeah. I, I'd, I'd never really thought about all those kids and peanuts as the boomers too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, well, and you can, you know, I mean, isn't Lucy like the perfect boomer? Like, <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, I, I, where does the Christmas special come from? Actually, how do how do we leap mm-hmm. to it? How do we leap to it being because you know one of the things that's funny about Charles Schultz reading about him is that he's like the biggest sellout in the world. Like he's just like, let's just make <laughs> money off this thing. Um, and he does. And there's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting. Even to the point of like, I, I, I haven't seen the 2015, like CGI, like computer animated peanuts movie. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. part of me was like, Oh, I, like I want to, there's like some purity I associate with peanuts, <laughs> right? Like there's some, yeah. like, this is too special too it hits yep. at too deep a register to be able to watch it like a pixar type movie about it uh but I've, yeah. heard I've heard it's pretty good actually um yeah but my, I, I wanted i wanted to ask you like where did that christmas special come from how did how did it how did mm-hmm. it become like an animated holiday special and where did this because it's at some point in the 60s it seems like peanuts gets even bigger than the newspapers yeah yeah absolutely um yeah schultz definitely definitely had a um um it's it's like once he it's like once he started hustling to try and get the to try and get the strip in a newspaper uh in the first place it was like he couldn't there was something impulsive in him he couldn't stop running you know Mm -hmm. like like he just he just kept trying to uh take on the next opportunity and um his first probably his his first big kind of uh commercial deal comes actually with um uh, Kodak Eastman company. And they were, they were introducing in the mid fifties, these cameras that were, that were super simple, um, that were basically kind of like our generation's version of disposable cameras. And so the kid, the kids could buy them and they take so many pictures and then you send it off to Kodak and they would send your pictures back and develop. And, um, but it, but it was meant to be super simple for kids. And so, it came with this booklet that was illustrated with with peanuts cartoons explaining how how the camera worked and and ideas for how to use it and so that kind of got it started um ford uh introduced a line in in 59 and 60 of uh economy size cars and uh and they decided you know who better than the peanuts kids to mm. kind of you know be the mascots for the for these um uh, smaller size. If you saw them today, these things are still gigantic, but it was economy size for the late 50s. So this is like Don um, Dra- Don Draper era. <laughs> telling yes. The peanut yes, stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is, this is a uh, J Walter Thompson firm, like, like using peanuts to sell, you know, to sell uh, cars. It's so mad, man. Um, but huh. it's, um, um, so they do some TV commercials with that. And so they they had to figure out how to animate, you know, these these 2D characters, how to animate them with the 3D cars. And so they they uh, worked with a company out in California to, to kind of figure this out. Well, so all of this is sort of uh, developing through the early 60s uh, to the to the point to where uh, a a. Uh, a friend and associate of Schultz's um, who was a uh, kind of documentary director gets the idea of like, what if, what if we did like a whole uh, TV special that basically turned the comic strip into a, a TV program. And so he starts throwing around this idea uh, to some executives. He hasn't, from everything I could tell, it wasn't anything more than just kind of a, a pipe dream. He had bounced around with Schultz a couple of times, you know, mm-hmm. the idea that this could be something. Well, in the meantime, he's talking to some executive folks like, oh, this is a, this is a great idea. Like, let, let's talk to some of our contacts. Well, they come back and they say, hey, Coca-Cola would love to buy a, a Peanuts special. Mm. Um, and so... And so Schultz gets a phone call and says, hey, uh, wh- what are you doing this weekend? Um, and uh, uh, she'll say, I, I don't know what, you know, uh, nothing 
nothing significant. And Lee Mendelson says, uh, well, hey, we're going to work on writing. I'm coming up to your place and we're going to write Charlie Brown Christmas. And she says, what's a Charlie Brown Christmas? <laughs> and uh, but they, you know, they hammer this thing out and um, and they um, get get going on the animation. Yeah. Mendelssohn is is the one who uh, suggest the idea of Vince Garaldi. He mm -hmm. heard some of his show because Garaldi was centered there in, uh, San Francisco Bay area as well. And, um, so it, you know, it's, it's a lot of local West coast talent, right. That that's, that's pulling this together for, for kind of East coast corporate America. That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so they, you know, they're throwing this together and they're, they're being really like, really kind of avant-garde with all of it like they're insistent they they don't want um they don't want professional voice talent they want it to actually be kids yes voicing yes. Uh, these characters um with uh, such an important the, choice honestly yeah, yeah 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 they they choose this very kind of uh low-key jazz music um for it there is there is really outside of the opening credits where the kids are all skating around on the ice and Snoopy kind of gets out of control and, you know, and they crash into the, the snowbank. Uh, other than that, there's really no action sequences or anything like this. And, you know, um, the, so it, it's, it's got a really uh, kind of, kind of weird tone for, uh, for a kid's program. Um, it has got this uh, deeply anti-commercialist uh, message, of, you know, like like Christmas and the holidays and 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 just these special family times are being ruined by by consumer, you know, by consumerism and commercialism, and um, you know, which which is uh, all too ironic that that uh, CBS and and. And Coca Cola pushing this. I was you gonna know. say it's sort of amazing <laughs> that like the conditions. <laughs> I just get real grad school about it, but like I mean the, the economic conditions that produce this thing um, yeah. and are yeah. incredible because it's like on the one hand you're like oh this is the most cynical like money grab you could think, but but at the same time it's yeah. like it's sort of a um it's sort of a vision of like golden era Hollywood stuff too, which is like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all just yep. a product made for money, but there is deep art going on here at the same time. Yeah. And that sort of dialectic yep. or whatever, that like push and pull between the the commercial and the art is is where it's mm -hmm. at. Like that's what produced mm -hmm. this. Yeah, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. what the, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and you know, there there's a real um you know uh, Schultz, Schultz became for, like, uh, so for, for part of the research on, on, or for a lot of the research on this book, I spent time in, uh, Northern California in Santa Rosa at, uh, the, uh, Schultz museum and archive, um, that, uh, that his family set up in the decade or so after he passed away in 2000. And, um, his, his widow, Jeannie Schultz, uh, would come in, uh, to the archive there, um, multiple times a week and she would bring like envelopes and folders and boxes of just all kinds of random stuff like like still like stuff that were, she was digging out of closets and attics that, that were still coming into the archives as mm. I was working on this mm. and one day she she comes in and she pulls out this sweatshirt that has um that has kind of the Schultz style um um uh Beethoven bust um, it kind of almost like with, uh, um, with, uh, it, it wasn't puff paint, but almost kind of like black puff paint sort of on <laughs> right. this gray sweatshirt. And, uh, she said, she says, you know, it's a funny story behind this. She said, do you know who, do you know who painted this on the shirt? And I said, I said, was it, was it Schultz? Was it Sparky? Is what they call him. Uh, I said, was it Sparky? She said, no, she said it was, um, Pablo Picasso. Oh my! God. I said, "What?" <laughs> She's like, "Yes, this, this this sweatshirt was painted by Pablo Picasso because Schultz they had met each other at like some kind of dinner party. Oh my and god! Had been joking around, and Schultz had made for Picasso a Snoopy sweatshirt that he had done by hand and sent it to him, and Picasso sent this back. And so it, it, it's just the wild, <laughs> wildest, weirdest thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> it struck me. It struck me that that um, that the pop 
the the artists of mid century are recognizing in Schultz yeah. in, in in what he's doing mm-hmm. kind of this there is this new pop art moment that yes it's it's very commercialized and yes it's 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 um kind of you know put on every little trinket there is in the world but at the same time it is it is connecting a mass audience to deep and thoughtful art in a way that it never existed in human history, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so there, there is even among people like Pablo Picasso, this infatuation with the work that that Schultz is doing in the daily newspaper. It, it's it's incredible. That is incredible, and I want to know where that sweatshirt is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, see the folks out in Santa Rosa. They, yeah, they, yeah. They have it in the archives. Yeah. Man, I don't go up to Northern California very much. I live in Southern California, but uh, when I'm up yeah. there, I definitely want to visit that. Um, Dude, that sounds it, it's amazing. It's such a cool. It's such a cool place. Worth uh, the trip. Yeah. I want to read this quick sentence, uh, if you'll indulge me, from your yep. introduction, because I think it gets at something I really w- wanted to get to, which I think is, to mm-hmm. me, like one of the, the hearts of, of, of one of the insights you're offering here. Is, uh, you mm-hmm. said that the, the comic strip uh, was capable of eliciting emotional connections to politics that did not always appear in more traditional mediums of debate, providing scholars with a way to think more deeply about the role of the emotional lives of Cold War Americans. I I love mm. that idea. Mm. Um, and can you talk about that with regard to like sort of like how he charts a course through the 1960s? Because you have this chapter on the Vietnam War, and it's just like okay. to me, it's like it, yeah, you can find insights about this emotional life that isn't in even like the pages. Of like I like all these, these radical magazines. You know, my stuff is on the left, yeah. and it, it's yeah, yeah. Th- Peanuts is in there. I mean, literally, you know, Peanuts <laughs> is in there, and it's a and and you know, there's lots of Snoopy stuff and archetypal, you know, images from the Vietnam War. It seems mm-hmm. like Snoopy provided some sort of language for people, or Snoopy Peanuts provided a language, yeah. especially Snoopy though in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, uh huh. But but can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? I think it's such a great. I think that's such a great point from your book. Yeah, well, I th- I think it I think it goes back to that uh, that distinction that that you brought up uh, at at the beginning of the interview uh, between Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury and uh, and Schultz's Peanuts um, that um, you know Schultz looked at what someone like uh, like Trudeau was doing and, and and said you know that's that's really that's really low hanging fruit. Like it's really easy uh, to make those criticisms. Um, it, he said in one interview, he said, you know, if, if you want to do that style, just, just point to whoever's in power and give them a swift kick. Right. Like, and, and, and everyone can join in with you and, you know, but, but he saw it as this very disposable type approach, right. It's just sort of this revolving door of, of big faces and uh, it was always going to be outdated. Uh, mm. by the next election. And um, instead, what Schultz saw um, w- when he dealt with politics, what Schultz saw was that, you know, a lot of, uh, and, and you see it in the letters uh, that people write back to him, the things that that the average person in a democracy cares about um, when it comes to politics, oftentimes are the things that they feel have most um, touched upon their life experience mm. right the the mm-hmm. the um the things that uh, I, I had a neighbor growing up who who uh was was in so many ways was so conservative but hated ronald reagan until the day he died <laughs> because he had been a member of a union and the way that reagan had handled the unions in his in his first term um uh they uh, they, he had he had lost work in, in a particular phase and and so he was just he was just done just done with the republicans for the next 35 years like mm. um mm. and even though so many of his policies by the 2000s had come to line you know so many of his his values lined up more with where republican politics were but he was having none of it and so schultz seemed to key into the fact that that people um, are very experiential in their politics, very experiential in this, in this, in this process. It's not so dogmatic that, that, you know, they take whichever side's party line, hook, line and sinker, right? It's complicated. 
And, um, and so you see that very much in the way that, that he sort of processes and deals with the Vietnam War in, uh, in the peanut strip, uh, this kind of, um, at, at the outset, this almost, um, sort of, um, well, I, I call it sort of a growing ambivalence towards the war, right? The, this feeling that, that, um, you know, they don't want to be, um, they don't want to be, come across unpatriotic, but at the same time, there's this growing concern that like, what are we even doing in this war? And why is it so important that we would, that we would spend so much in life and, and, and fortune and effort on, on this? Like why? Um, and, but yet at the same time, very adamantly, um, he is identifying with the experience of, of uh, the soldiers that are, mm-hmm. that are, are being drafted, right? Mm-hmm. He, he, he was in their shoes. He knows what that felt like and very concerned that they might get forgotten in this whole argument back home uh, over, over whether or not the, 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 the we're pursuing the right um, uh, politics in this war. Um, you know, one of the things mm-hmm. Schultz was, was very big on sort of, um, uh, private philanthropy, like, and, and I mean, like hidden philanthropy. Um, he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to make a show of the things that, that he was doing, but on many occasions, um, and, and he would not allow, he would not allow reporters to be there. He did not want it to show up in the press, but in many private occasions, he would make personal trips to uh, the VA hospitals. Mm. And, and they said he would spend hours uh, sitting with these guys, talking with them, drawing pictures for, it, it, for everyone. I mean, to the, to the point to where his hand was just exhausted, but mm. drawing pictures uh, for, for anybody that wanted it, spending time talking about their experience. This was, this was very personal to him. And it was, and it was a very personal conflict to, to his audience. And they wrote about the, about it kind of picking up on these themes in, uh, in the, the, uh, the war stories of of Snoopy in in the late sixties. Yeah, it's and you know it's that and that makes me think that you know he is the, the member of this greatest generation, you know, and sort of like that he's writing to them and not necessarily to boomers uh, who are like yeah. hi- hippies yeah. at this point. <laughs> and like you know, <laughs> and it is an emotional thing for them because of that World War II experience, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and I know mm-hmm. you can like fall into deep generalizations. Not everyone feels this way, sure. but there is something sure. there is something like a, um, that 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 Schultz is capturing there, where there's sort of like this split where you're you know, emotionally invested in the idea of America and, and, and patriotic duty. And, you know, at the mm-hmm. same time, looking at Vietnam and being like, what does that have to do with any of this? And it's like, yep. there's sort of like a, and, and if you look at all the boomer sort of art that's been created about the war, like Oliver Stone movies and platoon born on the 4th yeah. of July, a lot of it is yeah. about sort of that emotional rift and like that inner, yeah. that internal struggle. It seems like, um, yeah. it seems like that's, that's where Schultz is, is, is sort of charting his course through the Vietnam war is sort of like that, that, em, that emotional place. Yeah. Yeah, as, absolutely. Um, and, and so in, in this real kind of, um, I think he, he read it, um, in, in Bill Malden as well, you know, who saw, who saw these Willie these and regular, Joe, right? Yeah. 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 For people that don't know, Bill Bill Mullen is the is the co- the the comic artist who who did a lot of like uh, comics in World War II uh, and these characters Willie and Joe who were sort of like Beetle Beetle Bailey if anyone remembers Beetle Bailey mm-hmm. and sort of like I, I I can see that Schultz was maybe like yeah weary of doing more sort of like humor in uniform <laughs> type stuff yeah uh, but it's definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. there yeah. But yeah, these were these were guys who sort of, um, you know, if there's if there's a single takeaway from uh, from those stories, it's that like, you know, here are these regular guys who are just trying to do just trying to do their job. Um, It's it's dirty and grimy and not glamorous. And in many cases, they're the officers that are in charge over them. Don't get it. They Mm. they're they're detached. They're uh, they're interested in in, you know, fame and, or, or, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. So Car- you know, kind careerism of, and ego. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, um, so it's really this story of the kind of, the kind of, uh, foot soldier that, you know, that 
um, gets forgotten um, in in the you know kind of the grand view of things. They're not Eisenhower or or you know who, whoever that gets all the histories written about them, and 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 that's very much a theme in in the stories that that Schultz tells as he imagines these war stories, both in the Vietnam era and then later on when he brings in. Um, so Snoopy is is a pilot, right? And yeah. flying around. Well, eventually uh, Schultz is going to bring in uh, Snoopy's brother Spike, um, who typically lives out in the desert and all alone and everything. He's a particularly like you know morose and sad character, and uh, and and he's going to be a, a foot soldier in the trenches, oh. and you know riding back and forth to to Snoopy. And so yeah, so the, the yeah he's he's very adamant of uh, Schultz is very adamant about sort of tracking the story of of just like regular regular men that that were getting pulled into this against their wishes but uh, but yet trying to do their best to to do what they thought was the right thing but yet at the same time like they're not even convinced that you know that they're being told by their superiors the right thing so right like, right you know, so it, yeah very conflicted and yeah and, and there's sort of like a rorschach test um sort of element to his comics that carries him through all this turbulent politics. I mean, I wonder if you could talk yeah. a little bit about the race and gender part of that, because I thought that was really interesting. Mm. He, like, he adds a black character, Franklin, at some point. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because, you know, looking at the way we think about representation today and sort of like Black Panther and that sort of like mode of Hollywood being very outward about representation, he was very subtle mm -hmm. about it. Like he was like insistent yeah. and like there's almost like a resistance at some part, like of like even, <laughs> even doing this. Um, yeah. but that's, to me, that was a really interesting sort of window into his, what he was doing with his project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Schultz was, Schultz was, um, like, like most people in, in America in the late sixties was concerned about, um, where the country was headed. Like they had had these kind of great, um, um, historic seeming victories of, of 64 and 65, um, and these kind of uh, big publicized reforms. And yet by 67 and 68, it seems like um, they've they're they're it's like they're realizing they haven't made near as much progress as 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 they had had imagined themselves to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there's this deep concern about um like like what's ha what's happening to all of this and are we losing momentum and are we in danger of this getting pushed backwards by opponents uh, of this who now have found new footing in 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 uh some of the the chaos of 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 68 and um and so Schultz is very much concerned about kind of like what he what the right thing to do for peanuts is but he he his worry is that he can't write a black voice. Like mm. he's, he's worried that it would come across as patronizing or as, um, it, it, you know, today we might call it, call it appropriation. Like, like he's really worried about these things that, that it wouldn't, that it wouldn't necessarily be right. But, um, he has some, uh, he has one fan in particular that, uh, that, starts writing him in 1968 uh this this woman from southern california named harriet glickman um who is uh concerned about um concerned about children's media she has three small kids at home and uh and so she's she's been writing letters to a bunch of different venues and one of the people that she keys in on is charles schultz because of the incredible visibility of peanuts and is trying to convince him to introduce um, uh, some African American characters in, in in a way that would uh, that would help to promote um, a, a, a positive portrayals in in media. And so he kind of goes back and forth. He's like, I, I I like the idea, and in fact, I've thought a lot about this idea, but I just don't think that I'm the person that can do it. Mm. And um, she comes back with letters from some from some friends. She actually goes to some uh, she was involved in some different uh, advocacy organizations. And so she goes to some of her some of her friends in, in these organizations, some black families and and ask them if they would be willing to write letters uh, to talk about what it would mean to them uh, to to have this new 
uh, line of stories and peanuts. And so, uh, so she sends those along and, um, and Schultz is finally convinced that, that while he's going to remain kind of uncomfortable with exactly how to voice Franklin, he believes that given the moment, the political moment, and given the platform that he has, it's the only right thing that he can do is to, is to, kind of project this 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 vision of of America and in, in some of America's most beloved characters as a egalitarian um, diverse um, community and so uh, he embarks on that in the summer of 68 and um, and Franklin you know comes out of that and um, and it's it's kind of universally celebrated uh, in that in that period. Um, it doesn't become extremely controversial until um, a couple of years later when Franklin actually, uh, Charlie Brown had met Franklin on summer vacation uh, while he was at the beach with his family. So that's that's where they met. Um, but then over the next couple of years, Franklin moves to town mm. with, uh, with Charlie Brown and the other characters. And then he starts going to school with the other characters. And, and every bit of this, Charles Schultz, like so... He, he plays it as the most natural, normal thing in the world. Like there's no comment, no, like no one's concerned or thinks it's weird that Franklin's there. Um, it's just, it's just normal. And, uh, and Southern newspapers start, um, uh, start revolting. Um, the editors in, in some cases in Mississippi and Alabama and some other states start pulling those particular schoolroom strips, uh, and, and and telling the other. And, and so the, the syndicate, um, editor reaches out to, uh, Schultz at one point, uh, over a phone call and says, Hey, you know, we're, we're getting some kickback, um, on these schoolroom, uh, scenes. Do you think there's any way that we could, you know, maybe adjust this or not do those or, 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 you know, kind of to, to, you know, this is just really touchy uh, right yeah, now with, yeah. with with the South, and uh, and Schultz, in a, in kind of a rare moment of 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 uh, forcefulness, Schultz says, "Look, um, either you're going to run all of the strips the way I write them, or I quit, and Peanuts will be over." See, and, uh, <laughs> I, see, 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 that's that's what's interesting about Schultz is like I don't think the word I don't think the word is disingenuous. I don't think I don't think that's the right word. But there's something about him where he's sort of like you know I'm just the middle path here and I'm just selling newspapers. <laughs> but like to me, it's like that's that's he took a principled stand there, and and yeah. and even yeah. as much as he tries to make these strips and wants to make these strips sort of like these Rorschach tests where they can be interpreted many ways, there is, and I think that's what your book is sort of about, right? Is that there's a through line here. Uh, of, yeah. what he, of what he's of what he's of his of his his point of view and his values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely, and uh, and so yeah, in those cases, um, it, I, I think it I think it helps to understand. You know, I, I think it was always so easy to read Charles Schultz as Charlie Brown, right? Charles Schultz is Charlie Brown. Charlie right? Schultz. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and I think there's and I think there's a lot to that, but. Schultz was also adamant that, uh, and, and some of his, uh, friends and family members would kind of confirm this, um, that really each one of the characters in that comic strip were pieces of his personality. Um, and so there is definitely a strain of Lucy Van Pelt in mm. Charles Schultz. And mm. there are moments where he, ju- he just comes out and says, look, it's this way or, or, I'm out. I'm I'm done. And uh, and he knew, you know, he knows in that moment in 1970, he knows like they can't possibly let me walk out the door. Right. And so I'm using I'm using the the yeah. kind of kind of cultural capital I have to push for the thing I believe is right. Yeah. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about about Lucy uh, as as this boomer character? <laughs> because it's funny you say that because if, if Lucy really is the the sort of conduit for for Schultz sometimes, you know, to sort of like yeah. make it make yeah. a more pronounced statement about something, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that that totally makes sense to me because I feel like when I was a kid reading 
the comics when I, I especially paid attention to what Lucy was saying. I felt like, <laughs> and I didn't like her necessarily. I felt like she has, she comes off as very sort of know it all bossy. Uh-huh. You know, that's that, that's uh-huh. her character. Um, yep. but at the same time, I'm, I was always like, Lucy knows her shit. Like Lucy seems to like, <laughs> you know, have a sort of like, have a sort of like handle on things. It, it, where does the Lucy character come from? It, yeah. And, and, and how much is it? I, I guess we're getting towards like feminism in like seventies because it's like <laughs> Lucy and peppermint Patty. I mean, these figures became like, um, I don't know, like larger than life in, in, in the world of like gender yeah. discourse. Yeah. 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 Um, well, you know, Lucy, Lucy was very much like, so part of, part of the joke with Lucy is that, um, is that she's oftentimes, she can oftentimes be pretty wrong about the stuff that she's so adamant about. Um, Mm -hmm. and like, you see this early on with, uh, with, um, uh, when Linus is really little, Lucy is going around. <laughs> There's this whole series of strips where Lucy's going around and explaining the world to Linus and like um, in all these like, um, you know, like explaining how the sun works and like her science is like so off base <laughs> and completely made up. But she's so confident in it. And Linus is going, oh, my gosh, like. I, w- I would have never thought such a thing. That's incredible. And then Charlie Brown's in the background going, Oh, my stomach hurts listening. to this." <laughs> like, you know? So, you know, sometimes she's, she can be dogmatically wrong. Um, but, but, you know, other times like when, like sometimes when Lucy, I mean, when uh, Charlie Brown is kind of moping about, you know, whatever his feelings are like Lucy's kind of the one who cuts through it and is like, you know, it kind of like grow up, toughen up, move on. Like, you know, yeah, Five yeah. cents, please, you know. And, uh, <laughs> um, but, um, so, so Lucy is very much like this, this powerful, just, just, uh, force, uh, of a personality. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes rough, uh, around the edges, but, um, definitely uncompromising. Um, and, and then Peppermint Patty, Peppermint Patty is absolutely one of my favorite characters because, because Lucy, you know, Lucy doesn't really have any, Lucy has very few vulnerable moments, right? Perhaps her, her one key vulnerable moment is when she's around Schroeder, right? And, mm-hmm. and her kind of, her kind of adoration for Schroeder starts creeping out and, you know, um, uh, that's, that's one of her few vulnerable moments. Um, Peppermint Patty is, is incredibly capable when it comes to sports. Like she's the best athlete in the whole, in the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and in those arenas, she is super confident. She knows what to do. She can direct the other, she's the, you know, she's the, the coach for her team. Like she's, she's all about it, but in some other spaces, like she's a lot more, she's a lot more vulnerable um in the classroom she's not she's not a great student and has a lot of frustrations with that um in in love like she's she's very there's this very conflicted story with her that that she's kind of exploring some of these ideas with charlie brown to the point to where like some fans go oh well peppermint patty has a crush on charlie brown but you you read these storylines like no it's more it's more complicated than that Mm -hmm. like like it doesn't. Charlie Brown often assumes that he that he's the one that's being talked about in these conversations, but it's not always clear that that's what's going on. And then there's Marcy in this dynamic, right. and this yeah. close bond between Peppermint Patty and Marcy. And so what emerges is this is this readership uh, that that identifies with the kind of uh, frustrations and confusion and and just. The, this this conflict over I have these feelings within myself of who I am, but the world says it's not OK to be who, who I am, whether it's in the way that she dresses or in the way that she feels in these these relationships, mm-hmm. feels kind of overlooked and underappreciated for who she really is. Um, and and so there there emerges within this kind of feminist discourse of, of peanuts that, that, you know, folks like, um, for example, like Polly Murray was pulling, picking up on and, and writing letters to Schultz about that that are in the book. 
Um, but yet, uh, but then there's something even more kind of nuanced and intricate um, that that um, the LGBTQ community begins to pick yeah. up on, yeah. and 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 so these characters become. And of course, Schultz was was adamantly mentioned earlier, like Schultz is evangelical. Um, Schultz definitely uh, was was evangelical. Uh, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, into the 1970s, but he's kind of evolving over time to a to a place to where he really shies away from some of those labels. He he still he still personally reads scripture uh, um, in, in his personal life, but he has kind of disassociated from any kind of organized church mm, or yeah. or um, uh, thing like that, denomination or anything, and so um, so. He kind of personally is conflicted about um, when he gets questions about the the sexual orientation of of yeah. Peppermint Patty and Marcy. He just he he that's an area he won't even comment about. He just kind of stays out of it, right? But yet his audience um, just adamantly, and it's only grown over time. Uh, oh, totally! In, in, in yeah. the last few decades, this identification of of, of those characters is sort of um, some early public, uh, and, and, and quite, uh, quite proud. Like these aren't negative representations, like, like Peppermint Patty and Marcy are both very likable and lovable characters. Uh, and so, so early, um, uh, kind of positive, uh, portrayals of, of, um, of, uh, it, it, at the very least non- uh, non-gender binary mm, yeah. kind of characters, you know? Like, it reminds me of Bert and Ernie and sort of the, yeah. the, the way that people yeah. take the, uh, God, there's like, a, I feel like there's, there's, there's pr your project about, uh, you know, Charlie Brown's America. It seems like it opens up this whole world of kind of like, well, what the fuck are the Muppets? And, and like, you know, <laughs> what, what, what are these, uh, what is Sesame Street? Like, you mentioned Jim Henson, but like, I was thinking about Calvin and Hobbes a lot too, reading your book, um, because it seems like those characters are, are sort of, kind of connected in some way to peanuts yeah. uh in in sort of uh, even in the way that the readership is is very important in 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 creating meaning i mean you think about like all those like calvin stickers you know like peeing on truck you know the, those <laughs> you know the, like that's yeah. not anything about calvin and hobbs and yet it became that way and you see the same thing in like the vietnam war if you look up like snoopy vietnam Google image search that right now if you're listening uh -huh. you will find like all these really crass comics of like um, even like sexually crass, violent uh -huh. comics with Snoopy, mainly Snoopy actually, um, yeah. as the Red Baron and stuff like that, like worn on like the helmets uh, of like soldiers in Vietnam. It's really interesting because it, it means mm -hmm. that like, I mean, these characters have like, they have a world beyond the authorship. It like brings up this, yes. we can sit here and think about Charles Schultz and what he wanted out of this, but there's also like, uh -huh. you know, what everyone else wants out of it too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, and that was sort of, like, like these characters becoming one of the one of the points I was trying to make is that like, um, like the the characters and the tropes, the visual tropes of of the comic strip and things like this, like they become a sort of shorthand for expressing yeah. Yeah. all of all of my ideas, right? Uh, as the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Expressing my ideas through through these. And, and you can do it, you don't have to, you know, these people aren't writing a whole discourse about what they're thinking, right? They're doing it in a singular image. And in that image, you go, oh, okay, that person, you know, yeah. on a bumper sticker or on the, you know, and, and, and we have a tendency to go, well, that's not really very developed political thought or whatever, but this is the expressions of popular political thought. These you are memes. Like, yeah, this are, is memes yeah. uh, before. Yes, before, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Got Blake Scott Ball. The book is called uh, Charlie Brown's America, uh, the popular politics of peanuts. I, I, I feel like we could talk a lot more. Uh, you should come back. We can do a bonus episode and talk more about yeah, pe dude. peanuts and yeah. comic strips and stuff like that because, like, yeah. it's a, it's such a great book. And I wanted to give people, <laughs> I wanted to give people an idea of it. Thank you so much for for joining me. Appreciate it. Man, th thanks for having me. I, I you know, secretly, uh, I, I was never, I was never going to come pleading out on, out on the Twitterverse, uh, but, but secretly, I was, I was just hoping and waiting 
uh, to get a nostalgia t- uh, nostalgia trap uh, uh, invite because oh, I think so it's great. such a cool cool podcast and so I, I was really glad to get in here and talk with you well thanks so much and when I think about the nostalgia trap I mean Charlie Brown <laughs> and Peanuts is just as, as deep as it goes really um, so yeah, thanks so much yeah. appreciate it thank you Well, all right. I think that's going to do it for us today. I want to thank my guest, Blake Scott Ball. Go check out his book, Charlie Brown's America, The Popular Politics of Peanuts. I cannot recommend it enough. And I think it connects so well to so many of the things we try and get to on this program. Thanks so much for listening. If you want more Nostalgia Trap stuff, you can do that at patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap. We really appreciate all our subscribers. And you can access all our bonus material there, too. All right. We'll talk to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.